God, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you that we can gather here in your name and worship you in this place. Father, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we worship tonight. Be glorified in this summer. Desperation for you. We're crying out in desperation, waiting now in expectation. Crying out in desperation for you.
Lord, you are ours, you are our God, our King, our everything, our Savior, our friend. And we're thankful, God, that we can worship in this way, give you the glory that you're due.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord let's sing it out Holy Spirit you're welcome here Lord, that is our prayer tonight, that we, we would be overwhelmed by your presence. Lord, as we sing praises to your name, we pray that you would fill this place, that you would show us your heart tonight, Lord. Speak to us, so oh Father, draw us into your Jesus name. Amen. Well, good evening to everyone. Why don't you turn and greet your neighbor and then you can find your seat. just wanted to make a quick announcement. If you take a look at the info counter after uh, service tonight, we uh, got the new issue of Calvary Magazine, and they actually did an article on our church and also Bridge Fest. So uh, both are in this uh, new edition. Take a look at that, and there, uh, you might notice there's a very handsome young baby in there. <laughs> Don't know whose baby that is, but you might notice that. Take a look. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, thank you for being here with us tonight. We're going to jump on into uh, the Word. I'm uh, going to be taking you through Ezra 3 tonight. Ezra 3. So, if you need a Bible, why don't you take uh, one from the ushers? They'll be going around, and if you need one, uh, feel free to borrow one of ours. If you don't have a Bible, that is a gift from us to you. You can take that home. We would encourage you to read it and um, study it. So, Ezra chapter 3, and 
the book of Ezra is such a wonderful book. Um, if, if you have studied a little bit of the Old Testament, uh, one of the unfortunate things about the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, uh, there is so many stories and uh, so much of their history is a stiff-necked people who rebelled against God and uh, just complained time and time again. So Ezra is such a refreshing book because we really see the nation of Israel being restored as a, as a people, as a land. Um, we see the temple being rebuilt, and we really see kind of a revival and a restoration happen uh, in the nation of Israel. And it's such a refreshing book to read. Uh, we're only really going to be looking at verse 3, and then we're going to kind of jump to the end and really um, see this revival happening amongst the, the nation of Israel. Um, but to kind of give some background to uh, just how we get to the book of Ezra, um, the nation of Israel uh, was a nation, and uh, it had been a nation for a long time up until this point, and um, it was a nation under one king, under Saul, for, for quite a while, then David, then Solomon, and then in 931, we see a split happen uh, between the nation, the, the uh, nation of Judah, and then also the northern kingdom. So uh, they were a divided kingdom for, for actually most of its uh, history under the kings. And then we see something take place in 722 BC. We see the Assyrians take captive the northern kingdom. And then uh, the, something similar happens to uh, the, the kingdom of Judah uh, under Babylon. Under 606, uh, 606, they come in, they attack them. And then uh, in five. 586, we see Nebuchadnezzar come in and just destroy the nation, uh, destroy the temple, and then ultimately take uh, the Jews that were left over captive into Babylon. And we see the prophets throughout uh, the Old Testament really going before the people and saying, repent, uh, God is not pleased. We as a nation are in sin. Repent, repent, repent. We see that very repetitively through the prophets. And ultimately in 586, we see God fulfill a, a prophecy saying, you know what? I'm going to chasten you, and you are going to be captive, and you are going to learn. Uh, the, the disobedience that you've uh, had as a nation has consequences. So Ezra, now 70 years later, we see the book of Ezra kind of taking place, that God fulfills his promise that he would reestablish them as a nation. And this is, this is so, so wonderful for us because we are believers who believe in the promises of God. And as much as we see the providence of God in the Old Testament, so too God who is, uh, is an unchanging God, an unwavering God, is going to fulfill his promises to us as he uh, speaks so many uh, rich promises to us in the New Testament. So as now we know the background, as we know kind of what's going on, uh, coming into Ezra, we see something take place in, again, 70 years after the captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. In 536, we see Cyrus issue a decree allowing the Jews to go back to their land, allowing a people to reestablish themselves as a people. And we see the nation under uh, Zerubbabel head back and really, this is the first wave of the Jews. They're, they're, they're going back, and they're going to reestablish the nation. And so we're going to kind of pick up uh, here in Ezra 3. Um, just kind of, again, a little bit of background. Ezra 2, uh, verse 64, we see about 40,000 Jews going back. So, uh, you know, not, not a very large portion of them. And the, again, that was the first wave. So why don't we pick up chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to start reading there. And I'm going to go ahead and read. And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of uh, Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shelatei, his brethren arose and built an altar of, God, of the God of Israel to offer burnt offering on it. 
as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And so, the first thing that we really see them do when they, when they re-enter the land is, is not rebuild houses, is not to start to really build infrastructure. The first thing we see Zerubbabel do is build an altar and then offer unto the Lord, the Lord of Israel. I mean, you know, so often when, when we're trying to, to reestablish ourselves or, or, you know, maybe we're going through something in life, maybe dealt with some sin, and, and we're, we're really trying to, to just, you know, turn our hearts back to the Lord. You know, we can so easily come up with a to-do list. We can so easily think, you know, I need to build this, I need to do this, I need to do that. You know, when the reality is the greatest thing we can do when we're returning to God, when we're, when we're seeing, want to see renewal in our lives, is just build a, an altar in our hearts unto the Lord. It's not about what we can do, but just turning, again, just that idea of, of just looking unto him, making an offering on an altar unto him, you know, it's, it's our hearts that God desires in a time of returning. We, we want to build walls, and many times we want to build temples. But first thing we ought to build is an altar out of our heart to serve the Lord. But what God wants is a broken and contrite heart. He wants our hearts on the altar and again, we see this example that Zerubbabel is really showing before the nation. This is where we're going to start. We're going to start with an altar. And then God honors that. God honors that. And, and then we see the work of restoration further with this as they build this altar before the Lord. And then we read on from there in verse 3. He says, Though fear had come upon uh, them because of the people of those countries, they set their altar on its base and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening offerings. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the numbers required by the ordinances of each day. So each day, they're establishing the burnt offerings. Each day they're seeking their faces unto God. And God honors that. And the work will further. And we're going to see kind of just through this book, the work is going to further and God's going to redeem this people. God is going to pour out his faithfulness on these people. But it starts with laying their hearts at the altar. Verse 5. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for the new moon and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. See, not only were these 50,000 uh, Jews that spearheaded this return to their nation, not only were they establishing what was written in the law uh, the burnt offerings, the new moons, the feasted tabernacles, but they were also just willingly offering up free will offerings. See, the free will offering wasn't required of them, but they wanted to give. Out of the abundance of their heart, because of God's goodness, they wanted to offer up free will offerings. Truly, the time of captivity changed this people, right? Before captivity, we saw time and time again the nation of Israel running to idolatry and rebelling against God, but now we see a people through the chastening of the Lord so willingly giving their hearts unto him. This free will offering that the people were so willingly offering was a testament of God's transformation of the heart of man. Verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple and of the Lord had not yet been laid. And they also gave money to the masons and carpenters and food and drink and oil and the people of Sidon and Tyre 
to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, and according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, the king of Persia. So we're seeing this progression happening. We're seeing the blessing of God on this nation being restored and returning to a land. And if we kind of move into verse 8, we're going to again see this continue. But we're going to see something happen with this nation. Something that they haven't done in a long, long time. We're going to see the heart of worship restored within the nation. Take a look with me. Verse 8. Now in the second month, the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shilati, it's a hard word, <laughs> Jeshua, the son of uh, Jezadak, the rest of their brethren and the priests of the Levites and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem um, began to work and appointed the Levites, which from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of God. So again, they build an altar, but the temple has not yet been started. So now we're going to see the temple starts to come to shape. They're going to start laying a foundation for the temple. And in verse 9, we go on. Then Jeshua, the son, the sons and his brothers, Kedemel and his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. The sons of Henadad and their sons and their brethren and the Levites, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel and the trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Aspha and the symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David the king. They're s establishing worship within the nation. The priests are out. They brought out the trumpets. They brought out the cymbals. And so they start with an altar. And that is the work that starts within the rebuilding and the restoration of the nation. And then they start laying the foundation of the temple. And now the first thing they desire to do is worship God. Restoration of this worship within the nation. How sweet is it when we... And our hearts just run to God in worship. I don't know about you, but, you know, sometimes I go through deserts in my walk with God. I mean, some of you guys might not have that problem, but me personally, I have deserts. You know, when sometimes we, on a Sunday morning, we're just mumbling through worship. Why our hearts aren't just in it? You know, sometimes we just don't have the desire to worship God. You know, whatever the reason is, sometimes it's not sin, just sometimes our heart just aren't, isn't in it. And then when God comes and God brings that renewal in our lives and, and, and worship, just that, that work of God of worship in our hearts just springs about. It's like a wellspring of life. And that joy comes through worship. I mean, how sweet is that? When we go through those times of just, just enjoying God, and just being in awe of him, and then it just coming out of songs of praise in our lives. This is something the nation of Israel is going through, a restoration, a restoring of worship amongst the people. And then we go on to see, they sing a very, very popular psalm to this people. They sing responsively, praising and giving thanks to God, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. They sang responsively. See, we're seeing a response from the nation. You remember when Jeremiah preached repentance to the nation? Did Jeremiah see a response from the people? Hardly. He was known as the weeping prophet. He preached repentance and, and, and saw none of it amongst the people. There was little response, but in God's faithfulness, we see a response of the people. 
You know, I think of the prodigal son. You know, in the nation returning under Ezra, you know, I think of the prodigal son in bondage, you know, just squandering his inheritance. And then, and then as he was stirred in his heart to go back to his father, to just humble himself, and, and, and with a broken and contrite heart, he went back to his father thinking he was going to be a servant under his father, thinking his father wouldn't actually receive him back. But the father so willingly threw his arms around him, just in love and awe, that his son had returned. And out of that, how grateful was that prodigal son? Out of that, bring a heart of worship. And so when God receives us back, when God brings us back and restores us, our hearts long to worship him. See, God is faithful. Even when we don't want to worship him, God is worthy of our worship. But sometimes God has to remind us how worthy he is of our worship. Sometimes God has to bring us through a desert experience. Sometimes God will have to bring us through trial and then redeem us or show his faithfulness through it, his providence through it, and then brings a renewal and a restoration of worship in our lives. See, God is faithful. We can be sure of that. We read through the Old Testament and we see time and time of God's faithfulness. You know, so, so why don't we just read the word and say, yeah, God's faithful. And, and always have a heart of worship. You know, God knows we're people. God knows we're sinners. God knows that our hearts waver. And God knows that we need reminders time and time again. And he so faithfully did it with the nation of Israel, and he'll so faithfully do it with us. And they sang, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of God was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundations of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. So we kind of see a contrast, right? There's, there's younger people who are experiencing this for the first time in their life, and they're just, they're just in awe, singing with joy. And then there's others who are old enough to remember the nation before captivity. And, and they're just, they're, they're weeping because of God's greatness. They're weeping with brokenness. So we see this, this contrast of joy and of brokenness amongst the people. You know, when, when, when every Sunday morning, uh, Pastor Chris will do an altar call. And so often we see new believers come forward. And then we'll see people who have backslidden come forward, right? And, and there's, there's such a contrast. Somebody who just got saved for the first time, it's all brand new. It's like, wow, I'm saved. And they're just singing with joy. And then, and then somebody who maybe is backslidden is, is, is crying just out of a contrite and broken heart because of their sin, because of the backslide, that because they had walked away from God. But both can sit at the altar. Both can come forward and, and, and weep, and it's such a sweetness. See, if we're singing with joy because it's a new thing that God's doing in our lives, or, or maybe it's a, a, a transformation of, of that God is bringing us back from a, a uh, backslide, See, both are a sweetness of, uh, in God's eyes. There's the, the sound of crying, either or. In God's eyes, it's sweet. In God's eyes, it's, it's, it's a heart of praise to him. And so the people could not discern the noise of shouts of joys and the noise of the shouts of weeping of the people. For the people shouted loud, and the sound was heard afar off again. They couldn't hear the difference. And God couldn't see the difference either. It was just the people coming back to him and singing to the name of the Lord that his mercy endures forever. And truly, he is worthy of their praise. See, this is such a sweet time in the nation of Israel, but 
there was somebody who saw this coming. There was somebody, if we take a, a, a step back a little bit, somebody who saw this coming, and I believe has a, a big part of how God was able to bring it about. If we go to the book of Daniel, Daniel 9, you know, it might be a familiar story for some of you, but in Daniel 9, verses 1 and 3, we see Daniel in this context of this, reading the book of Jeremiah. And I'm going to read, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the book of the numbers of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face, and he began to fast. But when he, Daniel, reads God's word, he became so impressed by it and so serious about it. He knew the 70 years was coming to an end, and he knew God's providence was planning to bring the nation and restore the nation back to its land. He got on his face and started praying to the Lord. He started fasting before the Lord. See, God used Daniel as a tool to bring this renewal of a nation back. See, Daniel read the word, read Jeremiah, and said, you know what, God's going to do something. And I'm going to be a praying man about it. And when we read the New Testament, when we read in Revelation, when we read of the Lord's return, and we know God's going to so faithfully do in his word what he says he's going to do, is our response, well, God's got it figured out. Or is our response, you know, God's faithfulness is true, and I'm going to be on my face praying and being about uh, just faithfully seeking what the Lord wants to do and is willing to do and is promised to do in his word. Are we prayer warriors like Daniel? As when we read the prophecies of the New Testament, see, Daniel read it in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 13, that wonderful prophecy of, the, of, of what God was going to do after the 70 years. And Jeremiah just faithfully wrote the word, wrote the prophecy, saying to himself, as God's talking about a nation seeking God's face, a nation praying, if I was Jeremiah and, and all I saw through my ministry, I'd be like, yeah, not this people. But no, he wrote the prophecy, Daniel read the prophecy, and Daniel then sought God's face. God's providence, God's faithfulness, it's so sweet. We see it in the Old Testament. And then we live through it. Now, under the new covenant. God promised the Messiah in the old, brought him in the new, and then we get to partake in that wonderful promise. See, God's providence, not only did it bless the Old Testament, not only did it bless the Jews in this time, but God's providence is among us right now as we sit here, as we study the word. He said that he was going to bring Gentiles unto repentance. And I don't know about you, but I'm a Gentile, and I get to partake in that, the providence of God, the fulfillment of prophecy. And he's got yet more to do. And are we going to be like Daniel's? just seeking his face. So, we see the nation praising God, laying the foundation of the temple, and then we see them rebuild the temple. Again, kind of going through Ezra a little bit. We're going to skip a, and jump through a couple of chapters. We see the temple built. We see Ezra coming back. Again, Ezra is not there the time that Zerubbabel is building. Ezra comes back at a later point. Ezra is a priest and a scribe, 
And Ezra really reestablishes the law of Moses and the reading of the law amongst the people. And then we're going to take a look in Ezra 9, 6, and 8. Now, as God restored the people, as God restored worship, as God restored the temple, we're going to see something happen, something that's very important. As Daniel was a man who sought God's face and prayed for his people, so Ezra is living that example out. Ezra 9, 6 through 8. And I said, actually I'm going to jump to back to 5. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, and having torn my garments and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, O oh my God, I am, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has shown up to the heavens. Since the day of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty, and our iniquity of our iniquity, our kings and our priests and have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, to humiliation as it is to this day. And now, for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave, leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. See, we see Ezra, his face is before the Lord. He's lifting his hands before God just in brokenness. And he's got that broken and contrite heart that we talked about earlier. There was just a brokenness over sin. And God used the 70 years in Babylon to bring, bring brokenness of their sin. See, if we continue to live in sin as believers, God is going to start revealing to us. He's going to start convicting us. You know, he's going to start knocking at the door of our hearts. And he's trying to bring us to repentance. And see, if we continue in our ways as stiff-necked people like the, the nation of Israel, all of a sudden his warnings become a little more serious. And if need be, he needs to do as he did to the nation of Israel, bring us into exile, bring us into captivity. As the word of God says, turn them over to Satan in 1 Corinthians, dealing with an unrepentant believer. For the, de for the destruction of their flesh. See, God has his ways of getting our... Sometimes it's a pain, but it's brokenness, a purpose of res restoration of worship. Ezra seeks the faith of God. They see a period of grace, a grace, and God is eyes gives us lives, revival in the nation. If we want revival in our it's going to start with this, start with God who in in this people. He wants to. For he desires none to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of truth. See, that's our God. He is faithful. But it's going to start with us. It's going to start with us seeking 